Well, last week I did it again. I started a story and didn't finish it. Did you catch it? Oh, it wasn't a cliffhanger like the one several weeks ago, you know, about brethren medical missionary Norm Waggy completely losing his bearings while swimming in the ocean all alone at night in total darkness. Now, it wasn't a story like that. Anyone remember what, what I didn't finish last week? Well, it, it was a bit short. In fact, if your mind wandered for, oh, even just like 30 seconds, you probably would have missed it entirely. It w- although it was a true story, much less dramatic. All right, all right. I'll tell you. I told you about kids' church. And how that even while I was speaking, the kids were learning about knowing Jesus. And how that there were at least three different ways to know someone. Sounding familiar at all? Few, okay, I'm getting a few nods. First, I said we can know, a, know things about someone. You know, their name, what they look like, where they live, who their family is, what they've done. And second, I said, we can learn to know someone through what they say. We learn what is important to them. We learn what they know, or at least what they think they know. What they think, how they feel about things. Remember that? All right. Well, today, oh, right. I didn't say there were three ways, right? But I didn't tell you about all three, did I? I didn't finish the story. Well, I didn't finish it because the third way to know someone is what I want to explore together today. So it was actually on purpose. It's not always on purpose. (laughs) So third, are you ready? We can know someone by observing what they are like. It's a little bit different than just things about them. A little bit different than just learning about them through the words they say. We can know someone by observing what they are like, their character qualities, how they treat people, how they live, the manner of their living. Think for a moment about people, I'm going to suggest outside your immediate family. Think for a moment about people who have have been most influential in your life. Maybe a teacher, a youth leader, a coach, a friend. What is it about that individual or those persons? What what is it about them that made the biggest or deepest impact on your life? Was it their resume, (laughs) the things about them? Was it their personal or professional accomplishments? Let's imagine a teacher, for example, and the teacher, you know, comes into class. Oh, this teacher has written several books. They're an expert in their field. Is that, is that what tends to li- leave its lasting impact, its deepest impact? Not usually. Sometimes the ones who have written the most books are not the ones who impact us the most deeply. And, you know, often it's, Another option is maybe what impacted us most deeply were the specific things they taught out of their area of expertise. And sometimes that's the case. Sometimes someone, a teacher, helped us to understand a concept that really did transform our thinking. But I want to suggest that the majority of the times, What leaves the impact is who that person was in terms of their character, how they treated you, how they made you feel. It's been said people are not not going to remember what you do or what you say as much as they remember how you make them feel. And that says something about who you are, how you relate to people. It says something about your character and mine. Well, we're talking about discipleship. 
we're looking at like the ABCs, the foundation blocks of, of discipleship. And of course, discipleship comes from the root disciple, talks about one who would attach themselves to someone else to learn from them, to, um, to, to, not, only, to not only accept that person's teachings and way of life, but to, to commit themselves to, to kind of spreading, spreading those teachings, that way of life. And certainly within our Christian faith, we understand discipleship as the call to follow Jesus. But what are the, what are the foundational stones to, to discipleship? What, what's at its core? What, what ideas? What, uh, what practices? Um, and so we've started down this journey. I've kind of renamed it a little bit, uh, if you remember, and I don't expect you to. Um, uh, bulletin titles sometimes will get changed between the bulletin and when the messages get posted on YouTube or on our, on our website. Um, I was kind of keeping up this uh, um, finding our bearings theme from where we started. Remember that Norm Waggy story about swimming in the ocean was part of that. And we talked about finding our bearings and outreach. And it's kind of the same thing, but I've renamed the series, if you will, on discipleship kind of as a college class. And so the first two I called, if you look on YouTube, you'll see it's subtitled Discipleship 101. And then 102, that means you know year one, first semester, year one, second semester. And then Discipleship 201, second year, first semester. And today we're in 202, I think. Uh, second year, second semester. But just to remind you of where we've been in, that, in those courses, if you will, uh, talking about the foundations of discipleship, both, both necessary to understand for, for our call to be disciples of Jesus and also for our call to, to make disciples of Jesus, to call others, to extend his invitation to others to follow him and to be part of that process. That the Great Commission calls us not only to make disciples in terms of get them in the door, not only to make disciples in terms of just having them baptized and make their own commitment to Christ, but he goes on to say, teaching them to observe everything I've taught you. So you see, there's this cycle about becoming a disciple is more than just getting in the door. It's more than just getting your name someplace. It's more than just even making a public commitment through baptism and saying, yes, I've committed to follow Christ. It's more than that. That's the beginning. It's a journey. It's a journey of learning and, and becoming more like Christ. And then as we lead others into that journey, then it's, it's leading them, not just to get in the door, but leading them to learn and to become more like Christ. So, so with all that in mind, here's where we've been so far. Foundational stones, first of all, include believing that God is. This was from Hebrews 11. Believing that God is, that God created all that is, and that God will reward those who earnestly seek him foundation stone to, to Christian discipleship. The second week, we talked about believing that Jesus is who he says he is, that he did what the prophets, the scriptures said he would and what he said he would do, and what eyewitnesses said that he actually did, and believing why he did what he did, that through believing in him, we have eternal life. But year two, we began to realize that discipleship is more than just believing. And so last week we saw it's also, it's also listening to all that Jesus said and leaning into all that Jesus said and seeking to live out all that Jesus said and taught. Being a disciple is not just, is not just initiating a relationship, not just saying yes and then staying in our boat. But when Jesus asks us to follow him, a disciple follows and listens and learns and seeks to allow that to change our lives. But this morning, I want to suggest that it's more than just who Jesus is and what he did and what he said. That being a disciple, discipleship, is seeking to know Jesus' heart, seeking to be like him in every way possible. And so I want to, in a little different order, bring back before us the scriptures that we read together and that you reflected on for a few moments that remind us of the importance of 
of our lives as disciples of Christ, our lives mirroring his. That that, that, that becomes the goal in discipleship, is that, that a rabbi would, would call people to be his disciples. It was the goal of, of transferring himself into them. Not just knowledge, but wisdom, character. Not just to think like me, but to be like me. And so it was John, one of those who was called to be Jesus' disciples, who in a letter that he wrote to churches, to believers, said, those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. If we claim to belong to him, our lives should demonstrate it. We should walk as Jesus walked. We should live as he did. The Apostle Paul, in all of his vast ministry, many different churches, his letter to the Ephesian church called them to, he said, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. Then to the Corinthians, he took it another step further and said, you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. You say, wow, that's pretty bold. But see, that's discipleship in a nutshell. We should, sit, we should seek to imitate Christ. We should seek to follow his example to the extent that we can say with Paul, you want to know how to follow Christ, watch me. I'm not perfect, but learn from me as I follow Christ. Anyone want to say, yeah, I'm ready to do that? I'm ready to say, follow me, and you'll see how to follow Christ. The question is, why not? That's our calling. That's part of discipleship, is to be that disciple. Paul wrote to young Timothy, who is his disciple, and the things you've heard me teach... Pass on to other reliable people so that they can teach others. That it, it goes on and on. That's, that's the cycle of discipleship, is to build into someone else's life for the purpose of them being able to build into someone else's life for the purpose of continuing. And it was not just those who followed Jesus. Jesus himself said, a disciple is not above his teacher. But everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. It doesn't just say we'll know everything his teacher knows. We'll be like his teacher in recognizable, meaningful ways. And in John 13, Jesus around the table, or on one side of the table according to the picture, what we know is the Last Supper. And that beautiful, perplexing moment where Jesus takes off his outer robe and ties a towel around his waist and begins to wash the feet, the dirty, dusty feet of his disciples and calls them to do the same. And says to them, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Not just a teaching, not just words. I've given you an example. I've shown you. I've done it for you. Now do it for each other. And in our tradition, we take that seriously and we incorporate that in to our observance of communion. We call it the whole love feast that we have and we, we literally wash each other's feet. And those outside that tradition say, oh my, that's, it's a beautiful thing. But we dare not pride ourselves and say, we are being like Jesus. We are washing each other's feet. It doesn't stop there, does it? Jesus didn't do that just to give us a tradition to perpetuate. 
The tradition means something. It speaks of the way that we are to treat one another and treat anyone around us, the way that we are to live our lives serving, not seeking to be served. That there should be nothing that is beneath us when it comes to serving a sister or brother or a stranger, even to the point of washing dirty feet. Interesting, later in that same chapter in John, Jesus said to his disciples, love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Could it be any plainer than that? What proves that we're a disciple of Jesus? Our name on a membership roll somewhere? No. What proves that we are a disciple of Jesus when we can quote Bible verses? No. Both of those can help significantly. But what Jesus said, it's when you love others the way that I've loved. When you not only know about me and believe about me, that's, that's foundational. When you not only know what I teach, but when you live out what I lived out, when you love as I've loved you, then the world will know that you are my disciples. And apparently, apparently at least a few people in the church have missed that. I don't mean this church. That may or may not be the case. But it's heartbreaking that you hear the message from people outside the church sometimes saying, I like your Jesus, but don't really like his followers. When you hear that, it makes you think that maybe there's been a disconnect in our discipleship. That maybe something's broken there. That maybe we've been satisfied to have our name on a list, or we've been satisfied to know some Bible verses. Miss the heart of discipleship, learning to be like him. A few other scriptures that we didn't read that came to mind, Philippians 2, Paul again wrote this, calls us to have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had, who even though he was God, did not think equality with God something to cling on to, but instead he gave up his divine privileges he took the humble position of a slave. He was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. And he calls us to be like him. And our willingness to serve, our willingness to humble ourselves, to lay aside whatever privilege, whatever we might feel we're entitled to, to lay that aside for the sake of serving and loving and even dying for others. Peter put it this way in 2 Peter 2, 21 and 24, for God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in his steps. He never sinned. He never deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. No, we're not Jesus. We're not the Messiah. We're not through our death going to provide salvation and forgiveness and eternal life to the world. But we're still called to follow him. We're still called to live in that way. And God can use us in our small sacrifices, in our small deaths to ourselves, for the sake of loving another person. God can use us to bring healing to the wounds of the world. We are called to be like him. How do you do that? We've got to spend time with him. 
You know, there was a saying in ancient Judaism, and, and I did a little bit of searching this week because there was some question about, okay, is this just uh, the Christian version of urban legend? But there's supposedly this saying in ancient Judaism that's kind of a blessing, uh, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. Doesn't that just warm your heart? <laughs> Oh, there's, there really was a heartwarming part to it. The, the idea, as I've understood it, is that, that if you were really, if you were called, I mean, in the first place, being called to follow a rabbi was such an incredible honor that we can't even comprehend it in our culture. Usually, young boys would apply, and only, only a few were chosen. They would spend their lives studying the Torah and the scriptures and memorizing the whole Torah, five books of Moses. Can you imagine memorizing that? (laughs) Most of us can't even get through it reading and still not make the cut. And so imagine as Jesus comes to these fishermen and says, I want you to follow me. And that's what he says to us, I want you to follow me. The rabbi's doing the, uh, doing the asking. He's the one doing the calling. But getting back to Jewish tradition, the idea then is, is if you have been ca- uh, not called, that never happened except for Jesus. If you've been uh, accepted into an apprenticeship with a rabbi, you, you weren't going to squander that like we talked about last week. You weren't going to squander that opportunity. In fact, you were going to try to be as close to them literally. You didn't want to miss a single word. Often they travel from place to place. A lot of the teaching happened on the road, as we read in the Gospels. And you wanted to be as close as possible. One Bible teacher said, so close that whatever the, the rabbi stepped in was on the front of your robe. Ew. Including all the dust that he kicked up on the front of your garment and so this blessing may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi may you follow that closely may you know that relationship there is some legitimacy to that apparently the source of the saying goes back it's from the mishnah which is a collection of rabbis sayings collection back around 200 BC, quotation from a uh, uh, Yose ben Yoezer, never heard of him before, but he's one of the earliest members of the rabbinic movement, lived about, like I said, about two centuries before Jesus, and here's his quote, let thy house be a meeting house for the wise, and powder thyself in the dust of their feet. And drink their words with thirstiness. You say, well, no, it's not exactly the same thing. It doesn't say whether you're actually getting dusty from their feet by sitting at their feet like Mary did at the feet of Jesus while Martha was busy getting the meal ready. Or it doesn't specifically say while you walk in the way. It says, let thy house be a meeting house for the wise. Surround yourself with people you can learn from. People like Paul, who who by following them, we follow Christ. Who by watching them, we see Christ. Choose your friends wisely. Surround yourself with people who are imitating Christ, who will help you learn. Powder yourself in the dust of their feet. Whether you're sitting at their feet, whether you're walking with them in the way. And drink their words with thirstiness. Some good good images for us as we consider this matter of discipleship, as we consider not only believing that there is a God who created us and that seeking him matters, not only that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the Messiah, and that through him, faith in him, we have eternal life. That's a start, but it's only a start paying attention, listening to, leaning into, living out what Jesus said, getting close enough to learn to know his heart, doing all that's within our power, offering ourselves to God, asking for his grace that we might grow to be more and more like him.
people look at us and symbolically they see Jesus dust all over the front of us. May it be so.